I told you there was an alternative to machine learning based on neural networks? What if I told you you could run these models on MCUs efficiently because they cut out matrix operations and divisions from their calculations completely? And lastly, what if I told you I have two experts from Literal Labs with me in the studio today? Yeah, we got them in the studio today to help educate you, our beloved IPXs, on this so-called set for machine. You know, like me, you might have heard of them at university, but now that the term AI at the edge is stuck in our brains, having models that run on smaller, low-power hardware with less memory is more important than ever. I've got a couple questions for these gents, and today, you and I together are going to get to the bottom of this new fan dangling craze of settler machines. To do this, I will ask how a settler machine differs from a neural network-based ML approach, why the hell you might want to use one, where might you use one, and how the hell do you train the thing? I'm going to give you five short seconds to hit that subscribe button for more talks like this. All right, without any further ado, let me introduce you to CCO Leon and the co-founder Alex of Literal Labs. Leon, Alex, thank you very much for joining me in the studio today. Cool. Yep. Elliot, thanks for having us. Hello to all you IPX heads. Uh, good to be here. <laughs> Hi, Alex. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Awesome. IPX says we might keep that. Now, firstly, I want to ask about something that I read on your website. And it says, to meet society's needs, AI has to be explainable. It has to be fast. It has to be economically and energy efficient. Now, I'll come out and say, I agree with fast. I agree with economically viable and energy efficient. But why is explainability so important? For anyone that's using the models, whether we create them or not, you know, they... If you're using them in your day-to-day -day work, there are just a multitude of reasons why you'd want to understand why that model went wrong, why that model is slow, why which some parts of the model contributed to a bad decision and which part, some other parts did not. These are all things that only an explainable model built on a kind of glass box foundation can help you understand. As soon as you're working with kind of black box principles, it's much, much harder to then iterate on the model itself and improve it. So there's many benefits that, that this, this kind of approach brings to you. Right. So we say sort of our traditional uh, neural network approach, that's our black box approach, right? We have an input and an output and in between, Lord knows what's happening. But in a settler machine, your input follows a certain path to the output, correct? Yeah, exactly. It's discrete. You know, you're you're tracing that forwards. You're looking at the data coming in. Um, you have a number of points of data that the model learns to include. Then mm -hmm. you take a clause of this. That's kind of your and expression. And then you have a ensemble of voters, and you can trace through which uh, voters voted for which thing. And that is a very easy mapping from the prediction to the input data. It's very, very straightforward to then understand, okay, model made this mistake here, and this is why it did it. Um, or it got it really right. So we're aiming to get it right all the time, but it's a good exercise <laughs> to understand where it, where it goes wrong. Okay, so let's tell our viewers about what a settler machine actually is. And I think there's no better man to do this today than Alex. Alex, you have almost direct heritage to Settlin, correct? What, what is your link between you and him? Yeah, so yeah, we just started to talk about traceability. I think that if we, we can also trace the background behind uh, what's my role there. Well, in a way yes. that uh, I've got the lineage to Michal Zetlin, who was the uh, mathematician who came up with the idea of learning automaton in the early 60s. And he then passed this idea to somebody called Viktor Warshawski, who was my PhD supervisor back in the 80s. And uh, now I have to carry the torch now. <laughs> okay, carry the torch forward to the next generation who will be watching this video. How is a settler machine different to a machine learning alternative? Now, I want to know about the architecture. How do they look different? Yeah, a uh, settler machine uh, works uh, on the principles of uh, logic inference or propositional logic where you make uh, some rules uh, based on the some features that you want to uh, sort of analyze and make classification on. And so these clauses uh, or rules, they start to vote for certain classes. And this classification then uh, sort of uh, makes the decisions uh, possible. Uh, so the decision making is based on the selection of classes. So everything is based on logic, essentially. So logic rules uh, from top, even though if you collect some votes, 
uh, which sounds a little bit of arithmetic, so it's still logical decision making. So the other part of it is the training process, and training is based on the game theoretic approach with reinforcement learning, with penalties and rewards sent to the what's called learning automata, and this learning automata, they configure the logic connections. So that, that's essentially quite different from the uh, conventional neural network approach, which is based on matrix multiplication and some uh, black box uh, techniques uh, that are very hard to uh, actually analyze. So, Alex, I, I don't mean to be facetious here, but how is the settler machine different to simple logic? Right? You've got an input, some logic, and an output. How is that any different to just logic? Well, logic uh, has to be put in the form of uh, some kind of decisions. And, and uh, these decisions uh, are very often uh, based on very large amount of uh, features. So uh, if we take just normal logic uh, in the conventional computers, they are based on the uh, relatively small number of features and they can be specified either algorithmically or as the truth tables. And the, uh, mm -hmm. there are existing techniques for exact uh, logic minimization and uh, constructing the uh, sort of functions, Boolean functions. When you deal with the machine learning and AI, you've got myriads of conditions. You've got uh, thousands of features. So it's impossible to enumerate all their combinations and do the standard procedural logic approach. So you have to use the technique of uh, essentially uh, adapting to uh, the decision making on the tables uh, that are much, much more complex than these classical uh, logic techniques. Okay, amazing answer. That's really cleared things up. Now, Leon, I've got a question for you. Why would you use a logic based model over a neural network based model? You know, we've got hundreds, thousands of neural network based models at the moment, and they're all getting faster and faster and better in different areas. So why use a logic based model? So the reason why, you know, why might you use a logic based model over a neural network? Well, yes, they're getting faster. But as everyone here will know, um, who's watching this video, microcontrollers, in particular, edge devices, have severe limits on what you can allocate, how fast you can run, there are all sorts of frugality uh, concerns that you might have when you're working with such devices. So even modern day neural networks, if it doesn't fit into flash or RAM, you might con uh, consider a logic based model. And similarly, mm -hmm. if you have a model, but you want to make it close to real time or real time, again, you might consider a logic based model. And then of course, if you want the means to understand how to debug and optimize your model, aka you want to understand how it predicts, then you might consider a logic-based model. All of these three principles, explainability, speed, energy frugality, these are all things that come through logic-based models. Okay, and I, I saw you mention MCUs before. So Alex, why does a logic-based model work better on MCUs? Well, I would say that MCUs, they've got uh, quite a small number of possible instructions in which you can program eventually. So even if you write mm -hmm. the high level uh, code like C code, it then boils down eventually to the set of instructions uh, in your memory. And you, you have limited resources there. So you've got a relatively simple ALU, so arithmetic logic unit, which has uh, the, the selection of instructions that it can execute is rather small. You don't have even very often uh, multiply instructions. You just have to do it by adding and uh, shifting. So these are mm -hmm. the things which effectively connect your know, from the high level understanding machine learning uh, of your model down to the level of logic gates because everything boils down in logic gates and or not. Don't forget it. Don't so forget on. a software engineers. <laughs> <laughs> so software engineers have to be short circuited <laughs> down to the level of uh, Boolean uh, logic. And this is where logic-based machine learning is just the best possible way. So you don't have to go through the complexity of uh, compiling uh, some tensor uh, operators uh, for MCUs. MCUs understand much simpler uh, 
uh, instruction sets. Right. So you just mentioned something there that's interesting to me. Right? You said you don't have to go through the process of uh, compiling these tensor operations, right? Leon, how, how does how does literal labs even work? Have, have you got a compiler? How do you train one of these models? If by compiler you mean training tools, that's exactly what we're building. Um, so okay. at, at literal labs, we are building the mechanisms, the automation, and to be honest, the scalable processes, ergo using cloud compute to train these models on demand um, and, in, and to do it in such a way that it does a lot of the best practices for you. In machine learning, there's like a million foot guns. Um, it's it's so easy to have a functionally working program that you've got your maths mm. a little bit wrong and, oh, the model's completely garbage. Um, so <laughs> it's, it's like what we're building is the mechanisms for you to upload your data. Uh, we'll understand from that how to organize that, how to process that in an optimal way again for MCUs. Um, and then we'll, we'll deal with the training, uh, which you want to make as fast as possible. We might train lots of models as well in order to get the best possible model for your use case. Um, and after we've kind of done that model selection, then there's a whole other process to convert that ready for an MCU or, or frankly, whatever deployment target you care about, whether that's mobile, uh, you know, x86, it doesn't matter. Um, there are benefits to be brought to all. Right. And Leon, just to round the conversation out before we head off into the night tonight, what are the applications that these models are best for? What sort of possible applications will the people watching this video be training for? I think, you know, in response to your viewers, it's clear that um, anyone that's playing with models uh, at, at the edge will understand the constraints and the difficulty of getting those models um, into production or frankly, just even to a hacky prototype, right? And mm -hmm. really that's what, that's kind of the superpower that this company brings is that ability to create really fast models that are just as performant predictively um, but doubly predictively, uh, sorry, doubly performant in other dimensions as well. So I think fundamentally, if you're working at edge, we can bring the ability to make your model smaller, faster, more energy frugal, so you don't burn your battery or your bomb costs can be lower. Um, mm -hmm. If you're not working at the edge, if you just want to process tons and tons of data, um, that's another great use case. If you've got um, kind of climate concerns, or initiatives at your company and you're using AI, maybe uh, what we're building here might be a good fit for that. There's there's kind of like lots of ways mm -hmm. we can play in this space. Amazing. Leon, Alex, I think that's a great spot to finish off tonight. Thank you very much for joining me in the studio. Cool. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. Great. So in conclusion, Literal Labs are building training tools to allow you to come and upload training data, train your own performance Setland machine based model and implement that on your Edge hardware. Now, this has been an exclusive video only on IPX since they are completely in stealth mode, but they wanted me to say if there's anything that's resonated with you today, you know, anything they've said about struggling to fit your models on hardware, you know, finding they are too latent, or you requiring a model that is truly explainable to go talk to them. Well, as always, stay disruptive.